Well, welcome everyone. I'm very, very excited to be speaking with Lucia Ale today. Um, Lucia is um, a recent uh, um, kind of faculty at GSAP uh, who was hired um, a year and a half ago and is teaching for the first semester, but of course an incredibly well-known uh, figure in the discipline. Um, for many reasons. I, I, I really always think of you as a bridge. Uh, one, you know, as a bridge between uh, practice and discourse, practice and, and theory, um, as someone who, who really has practiced, but then kind of drifted towards a kind of more um, theoretical perspective, but still trying to connect those dots as a as a bridge between engineering and architecture, you have both formations, which is very unique, probably for an architectural um, for an architectural historian, and also, I think, um, a bridge between cultures, uh, um, uh, personally, and also in your scholarship, uh, kind of uh, sort of you have been decentering the the European perspective for some time uh, and making visible. Um, other histories uh, from North Africa, from the Middle East, uh, and a bridge between uh, preservation and architecture as well. I think you've become a sort of uh, really a spokesperson for the question of the monument uh, at a time when monuments are really coming under question, under attack, some coming down, others uh, kind of emerging. So it's just like, you know, what does it mean to be someone who's kind of bringing all these things together at the moment where things are shifting uh, right. and, and are being, in fact, pulled apart? Um, and so my first question would be, what do you think uh, about architectural history at this moment? I, I, I feel like it's been in, in a sort of incredible movement that has happened, happened over the past um, 10, 15 years, like a new generation, the formation of aggregate. I mean, there's just like this kind of, the notion of the collective actually almost emerged in architectural historians where practitioners were failing. So I think that's very interesting um, to think about that, right? The collective used to be the, the space of practitioners and, and historians sort of took it over uh, <laughs> with this new generation. And so, so you know, it's so alive, uh, architectural history, uh, and wanted to get your thoughts about uh, yeah, that's great to know that um, that's what we uh, seem to represent a kind of aliveness. I think of it that way, certainly. Um, it's strange that you should say the bridge, uh, that you should attach that figure to me personally. I feel that that's how the field is. Mm -hmm. I mean, in a way, I, I identify myself as someone who's very lucky to have been, to have arrived in the field when there was no longer a sense of separation either from discourse in the studio, let's say, or in practice or from the rest of the humanities or social sciences, and indeed now even the technical discipline. So I feel that there's a very robust discipline. We are pretty robust. We have uh, journals and uh, conferences and groups and different groups and, and disagreements. And this is usually a, a sign of vibrancy. Um, and definitely it's true that thinking, let's say the practice turn or the technical turn in, in the social sciences, uh, the turn to interdisciplinarity in the humanities. This is something that architectural historians have both benefited from because architecture, to repeat a very old adage, has been very interdisciplinary. And of course, it has a technical aspect. But not only we've benefited from it, but now what we say really has begun to matter because we, as a discipline, uh, have robust institutions and have a, a place and a voice. So we, we uh, have a place also among the field. So, where it's going, I'm not sure exactly, but it's certainly this act of decentering. It's very, um, it's very kind of exciting and at the same time humbling, because things move fast. And uh, to be a scholar in a moment when things move fast is a very humbling experience. And in that sense, I actually feel lucky to be in an architecture school where, in a way, you have feet on the ground, boots on the ground, in the form of students and practitioner faculties and and links across. So it's humbling. Um, yeah. Certainly. Well, we are all humbled in this moment to kind of being uh, very much, I think, um, um, driven, you know, from 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 below, from around us, from you know, a sort of call for action, and uh, and you know, it's been 
it's been a long time since this call for action is so centered on issues of curricula and pedagogy and uh, you know, notions. I mean, we've been talking about decolonizing curricula for some time, but there's a sense of urgency now and a specificity and a question mark as to can we do it and how do we do it? And and um, and uh, so I wanted to get your thoughts on certainly the kind of introspection uh, that the history theory sequence has, is going through right now uh, at GSAP and, uh, you know, where are the moments you can't do it all, but there's kind of moments of interventions um, that are that are staking um, the project more solidly somehow. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I'm new to the school, as you as you know, so I'm discovering that in a way the history theory sequence has done its work before many other schools by making literally putting a question mark at the end of architectural history or at the beginning. So the sequence that you take as a student arriving at GSAP in architecture at least is not architectural history, but questions in architectural history. And that's been really, um, it's, it's my first semester teaching it. So it's a great learning curve for me. Um, but what's nice is that it's still anchored again in the text, in the primary text. And so we historians have techniques too. We also have a material culture and we get students to be engaged with this original literature. It's a challenge because there's not so much, not every culture was able to write down what it was doing architecturally or architectonically, but there are ways around it. So I, I find that that's very exciting. I also, arriving at G, GSAP, realized that this the built environment at all scales really is present, uh, even in conversations with other history theory disciplines, certainly with historic preservation people, but also the, the planners mm -hmm. who have their own discourse. And that it makes for a very different history theory curriculum. I definitely think certainly it decentralizes it more. Uh, but questions of land, questions of, um, you know, uh, you now I'm asked a lot about monuments and it's impossible for me to talk about monuments without talking about the land around it and the, the space around it. And in a way that is, uh, in any case, the American contribution to monument discourse and monument practices, you know, the, the national parks, which are the American monumental, yeah. like that was, that was an American invention. So uh, definitely GSAP, I feel, is kind of at the forefront of, how history can kind of intervene in these in these um, issues, and it's very nice also to hear you um, speak about this because I do, I do this has been in the works for some time. This sort of the, the programs and the different disciplines coming together, right? Where where maybe architectural history has emerged as a very strong discipline, but at the same time, what's been great is that architecture and planning. And preservation and even real estate, you know, these different programs are actually much more interconnected uh, in, in, in coming together um, uh, in, in various ways. And I, I you know, it's, it's, I find it also fascinating that you are bringing the, those questions to materials such as concrete. Right, I wanted you to, you know, so 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 like that, like really anchoring it, and that's the architect. I, you know, I I'm thinking the architect in you. So you know, what is what is concrete? What is the history of concrete? But oh my goodness, no, but I mean the conference that you're, yes, your own work on uh, anchoring some of these questions in the, in the material. Concrete is the second uh, most common material in the world after water, apparently. I'm told by my engineering friends. Uh, yeah, thanks for yeah, thanks for connecting that. So I'm. I've done quite a bit since I published my book, I decided to do some collaborative work. So I co-wrote one essay on Alois Regal and his notion of mood, which is very sort of abstract and somewhat in niche, let's say. But then I also did a project with my colleague, Forrest Meggers, who's an engineer, an environmental engineer on the history of concrete and specifically the history of the carbonation of concrete, which is the way that concrete fails. The way concrete fails is because the carbon in the atmosphere comes to penetrate uh, into the uh, into um, the concrete pores and eventually uh, through a complicated sequence of events the rebar rusts expands cracks and the concrete loses its magical power of being kind of like a liquid stone and so um, Forrest and I neither one of whom are particularly concrete experts uh, wrote a paper together asking why did this finding not uh, change uh, the ubiquity of concrete and in particular, if you take the carbonation equation that says how this um, unfolds, 
you can predict that pretty much anything built in concrete with standard dimensions today will fail in about 100 years. Mm -hmm. And since concrete was invented about 100 years ago, we have this amazing image of kind of a moving wall of obsolescence that's raking through the built environment. Right. And so rather than simply bemoaning it or telling a history, we are having a conference where we're bringing together the people who have the knowledge, engineers, designers, uh, uh, conservators, architects, um, and we're uh, discussing how they, their knowledge of the conventionality of concrete has not coalesced into kind of major public rethinking of the mm -hmm. material. So that's, that's this weekend, I suppose, when the open house happens, it will have been passed so everyone can watch it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> But, but it's so great to, I have to say, in terms of interdisciplinary collaborations, to work with Forrest, who's basically uh, an engineer, to about the status of basic science as a kind of knowledge. Because even for engineers, basic science is barely something that they use to talk across fields. Um, the, the sciences and engineering are just as siloed, in a way, mm -hmm, that's as all the uh, humanistic and social scientific fields. So it's been really interesting to try to do something out of the box, let's say, uh, together. And it's also interesting because as obsolescence of concrete is being maybe traced or, you know, there is um, kind of old new materials that are, you know, I'm thinking about the conversation you, ha you had with uh, Lola Benalon on, you know, like reclaiming uh, practices with earth, with bamboo, with, you know, low carbon materials and, uh, materials that we've um, uh, sort of abandoned uh, 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 with industrialization and, and modernism and now that are being unearthed again. Uh, uh, and so this kind of uh, sort of uh, uh, fall and rise maybe uh, that uh, also the students are really hungry for actually. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's been interesting. I just had maybe three conversations with Lowland already and she'll be in the conference as well, but already you can sense a kind of new wave of teaching about technology and about techniques that really also the calculative imagination has permeated also how we think about the responsibility of the architect and the engineer work yeah. and, the, and the private person and the public person every private person in the world of a certain um, in a certain discourse is asking themselves is making calculations every day how much of this material does i use how much um, uh, how much do i consume of this every consumer let's say is invested in this kind of calculus. And so why shouldn't architecture take a lead in, in giving people some, some um, guidance, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and not only calculative guidance, not only numbers, but also, you know, ways of thinking. Ways of thinking, um, how, who, who's building, uh, you know, practices and, and, and not, not just being responsible for the drawing, but, you know, what the lines yeah. indicate in terms of, uh, uh, well, thanks so much, Lucia. It's been incredible to uh, have you um, now really integral to the school and shaping its future with the students, with other faculty, um, and uh, just very excited to see uh, where you take all these uh, sort of um, threads and weave them in in a new in a new way. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Okay.